It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 302 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 1st of July 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And a GP, a writer and TV personality best known for hosting Embarrassing Bodies Down Under, a show for which I was rejected as my body is even too embarrassing for that. Welcome back. Dr. Brad Mackay. We have standards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and rightly so. I'm not you know, unhappy about it. It's a fair call. Uh, it's good to have you back on the show. It's been a while. How's Thanks things? Thanks for having me back on board. Yeah, good. Good. Not, not shooting any more embarrassing bodies at the moment, but I will put your, your name down for season two uh, if we ever get around to it. Thanks, I think. Uh, <laughs> Well, before we start, don't forget you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate, and you can support us there on Patreon. Every little bit helps. Choose a level to donate and what reward you want to get for it. But on the show today, we're going to be talking about gaming addictions, the coldest place on earth, a 13th century Vatican manuscript that's got historians all aflutter, and parasites with mind control powers that don't actually need to infect the animals they're controlling. Fun stuff. <laughs> mind control is always fun stuff. It is. So last week, the World Health Organization recognized for the first time gaming disorder as a diagnosable condition. Brad, this comes on the heels of a lot of controversy uh, from parents and some psychologists particularly over the video game Fortnite, which is the latest must-play game at the moment. And it's not uncommon to see up to 2 million kids playing that game simultaneously. So what does the WHO say makes up gaming disorder? Yeah, well, this is, this is quite interesting. And I, I think it's about time that we actually had some uh, scientific validation for this disorder, but it's also putting into context as well. So uh, as you're saying, uh, the World Health Organization has really come forward and said, yep, we're wanting this to be part of the 11th revision of the International Classification of Diseases. So looking at gaming disorder, not not being titled gaming addiction, as it's being said in the media around the world at the moment, but gaming disorder. And I just wanted to clarify that as being different from the DSM, so the, the diagnostic mm -hmm. manual that all, all of the psychiatrists use. So it's not quite in that yet, but it's sort of a step towards it. So uh, we're really talking about people who have uh, a persistent um, problem. So they have impaired control over their gaming. They, they're giving their gaming increasing priority. Their, the gaming takes precedence over other things that are going on in their life, like eating or washing. <laughs> Often people don't have showers because they're playing uh, Fortnite for, uh, for days on end. And the, the gaming continues to escalate as well, despite the occurrence of negative consequences. So they can sort of see their life falling apart a little bit, but they, they're unable to stop what they're doing. And the definition is saying that this needs to happen for at least 12 months, so over 12 months. And um, yeah, it has to result in significant impairment in their personal, family, social, education, occupational, or other important areas of function. So if we're wanting to put this into a bit of context, I see a lot of uh, teenagers or people in their, their early 20s, particularly, who are sometimes still living at home or they're living on university campus and they're just putting more and more time into to gaming and everything else just falls on the wayside. So well, we're not talking about the majority of people. So we, we estimate that about 98% of people who are gamers actually do it fine and they're not having any problem. It's not affecting their life. Um, I remember when I was at university I'd, the games weren't quite as good as what they are now but um but i'd be sort of gaming for a while and um yeah try, trying to finish off a game and then i'd go back to my normal life and then start studying medicine again so it, it really didn't impact on my ability to function as a human being too much and i had work and other things going on in life it wasn't just gaming that was taking uh, taking a hold of me so we're really talking about a just over 2% is what we're estimating of people who are gaming 
seeing who actually have it as a pathological problem. And so some of the patients that I see will come in and they look like ghosts because they hardly get outside during the daytime. Um, they're up gaming until sort of 4, 4.30 in the morning, sometimes even earlier, sometimes till the sun comes up. And then they're t chronically tired all the time and they're coming in mm -hmm. presenting going, oh, I'm really tired. <laughs> like, well, you've been gaming all night. Maybe there's something in that. So, so part of part of it as a doctor is you're there going, okay, well, if we actually took gaming out of the equation, then we could actually get some better sleep patterns. We could help somebody function better with their life. They would eat more regularly. Um, there's a whole range of different things that would sort of fall into place a little bit if people weren't spending all their time gaming. So having this as a diagnosis enables doctors to actually think about it in that terminology to sort of go, okay, well, yeah, like primarily gaming is a problem. It might also be leading to depression. So if somebody is getting sleep deprived or they're not eating well, um, or if they're not interac interacting with their peers, then certainly it can lead to depression down the line. But it also interacts because some people who have depression, or sorry, some people who have anxiety or social phobia may end up gaming more because they just don't want to go out in public. So this yeah, is it's where like a it's, form of uh, avoidance. Yeah, exactly. So it's creating a mm. bit of a controversy, and this is what people are sort of arguing about in the media over the last couple of weeks. Um, just going, well, look, so we don't want to be missing out. Like if somebody has ADHD, and that's why they're sort of like gaming and they're up all night and they're sort of expending all their energy like in this game. We don't want to miss that as a diagnosis and just say that it's a gaming disorder. So, and we've got to be really careful that if somebody does have major depression, that um, that we are treating them and sort of giving them antidepressants if we're needing to rather than just stealing their their playstation mm. so yeah so the the, um, <laughs> the the american psychological association has also sort of come up with a, a proposed addition for the dsm-5 or the next version when that comes out so they're just saying that it's um that people would have a heavy focus on on internet gaming but yeah also you don't have to be connected to the internet to have a, a problem you can get withdrawal symptoms when your when your gaming is taken away so if you're going to a retreat, like um, many of my patients want to do, just to, to get get away in the forest somewhere and uh, and have their their PlayStation thrown onto a, onto a bonfire, um, they'll be screaming. I'm sure they'll be getting withdrawal <laughs> uh, if that was happening. Um, some people are getting a tolerance, so they need to spend more and more time gaming. So there, there's all of these sort of things, but you can also relate that to to other things as well. So if you are just sort of yeah. focusing on becoming a drag queen and you were like investing all of your time and makeup and lipstick and finding the best dresses and if that was taking up all of your time then you could be diagnosed with drag queen disorder like it, it's sort of like anything <laughs> well, could really come yeah in. that's that's what i sort of wanted to ask you about is why is this a specific thing that needs to be set as I opposed you were to say I, th I thought you were going to say i was going to ask you why am i doing these things i can't say <laughs> no i know why i'm doing it i look great in pump uh, but, <laughs> Uh, well, this is, this contrast is, that with my earlier statements about the embarrassing body. Um, <laughs> but, but why, I mean, there's lots of other activities that people do get addicted to. Why do we need to specify that this is a gaming disorder as such? Well, we've really been following this for about 30 years. So um, so when computers first came out, when people started gaming, when I was a, a young kitty, then yeah, like we've been seeing this happen over time. But we're really seeing that this is becoming more of an issue with society, that um, that we're, we're finding that there are a lot of people, like even if it's 2% of people that are addicted to that, that gaming and having a gaming disorder where it's affecting their life, that's still millions of people all around the world. So there's far less people affected from their drag queen disorder. So, so this is sort of like why why we're focusing on this now. Um, we may get to drag queen disorder later on, maybe in the next sort of ten to twenty years. <laughs> so, and according to the government, these people are also to blame for our slow internet. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, um, that that could be one explanation from the government. But, uh, but yeah, there are, yeah, there are probably a few other problems as well. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? Like, one thing uh, I wanted to point out, though, was uh, we talk about the 2% or 2.4% of people who are likely to have a problem. That does come from, a, uh, I think, a 2017 study done in the US, the UK, Canada and Germany that had 19,000 gamers complete a survey about their symptoms of gaming disorder. And only 2.4% of, of those had at least five of the symptoms needed to be diagnosed. 
I do kind of wonder about that because any self-reporting survey, there's, I think, a barrier of entry where people are not going to say, oh, yeah, I'm addicted to this, unless they really, really, really are, if you know what I mean. They're going to be more self-selecting in what they report on a survey? Yeah, well, there's a lot of denial that goes on. So we're, yeah, and everything's on a spectrum. So you will have a number of people who do have a disorder, but they're just not acknowledging it themselves. So yeah, it depends on how wide you're casting that net. And some people will go in and out of it. So that that's the other thing. They might be like addicted to gaming for six months and then stop gaming for a while and be okay. So it's really, yeah, fulfilling that criteria is when it's, yeah, causing a problem for more than 12 months. But there, there are a number of people that have lost their jobs because they've been gaming and they're too tired to turn up to work. There are so many kids that I've sort of talked to who have um, needed to drop out of uni because they're, they're not allocating their time properly. And yeah, like often people, if they're trying to move out of home and trying to hold up a, a job, they can't do it, then they've got to move back home again and then they're perpetually their childhood for, for years and years and years. So what, there's um, there's a doctor, Jean Twenge, who I love over in the States, who does a lot of statistics. And so she was looking at the, the bigger picture. So she sort of jumped on board with, uh, with the, the latest news about gaming disorder and just saying, look, this is just a symptom of a wider problem. So everybody, like, you don't need to be gaming. You can be on your phone. You can be on social media. Yeah, like there's been, there's been a, a sharp uh, increase in the number of people with anxiety and depression uh, in their teenage years after 2010 when sort of smartphones really sort of came into being and, and went across the world. So I think this is a bit of a, a, a sign that um, that we're overusing our, our social media, we're overusing our screens and a bit of a reminder that we need to get back out in, in nature. Uh, we needed to put our high heels on and, uh, and walk down the street in a beautiful <laughs> dress, Ed, to, uh, to keep on uh, socialising with other people. <laughs> Well, that was, I think you've partly answered the question that I was about to ask, which was, uh, as a GP, what would you recommend that uh, if anyone thinks they may have a problem with gaming or if any parents think their child may have a problem, what should they be doing? What uh, what do you recommend? Yeah, well, I, I certainly recommend talking with your GP about it. I'm very biased because I am a GP. Um, often, if parents are wondering what to do, it's really a really good idea to book a long consultation with your GP, about half an hour, and then have half an hour where you're sitting in, oh, sorry, 15 minutes sitting in with your child and sort of like talking about the issues and then get out of the room and have the, the latter half of the consultation where the GP can talk one-on-one -on -one with your child as well, with your teenager or young adult. So um, that's a way of sort of introducing them to the, to the GP, um, easing them into the situation and then the GP can sort of work out uh, where to go from there. And there are many psychologists these days that are actually starting up um, clinics and uh, focusing on youth and making sure that, um, that they have options to sort of Help, um, help teenagers interact with each other um, and, yeah, get them away from, from their screens. So there are all these programs that are starting up over the world. And so having this definition actually enables us to think a little bit more clearly about what's, what we're doing um, and actually find a way of treating people rather than pulling it in with depression and anxiety. If we can see it as its own entity, then it gives us a, little, a few more options and, um, and in some cases a little bit more insurance that people can uh, plug into as well. Terrific. I must say, this is great. Usually we have to remember to put up the disclaimer. Oh, by the way, uh, don't take anything we say as medical advice or whatever. It's great to have an actual doctor on that we can say, listen to what he says. <laughs> <laughs> of course, see your own Especially GP. when what he said was go and see the GP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I always think it's uh, interesting when we have any change to like the DSM or uh, any new diseases announced, I think, or disorder. It's always interesting to delve into that and look into what exactly is going on. So thank you for that, Brad. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let's move on. And Penny, new satellite data has found the coldest place on the planet at a brisk minus 97.8 degrees Celsius or minus 144 Fahrenheit. Now, as someone who hates winter, this is probably somewhere I should avoid, right, Penny? Yeah, Where is well, this? It's in, I think we can all probably guess, it's in Antarctica. So yeah, it's pretty easy to avoid. In fact, it's quite imperative to avoid because if you took more than two or three breaths at that temperature, your lungs would probably hemorrhage and you would die. So, <laughs> so 
That's okay. not what you want. That's not what That's you want. That's definitely not what you want. No, no, no. And living in Melbourne, I know a lot of people have said to me, Penny, how would you actually survive if you live somewhere that was really cold? I like to whinge about winter, but <laughs> <laughs> like we stay in the positives here. Anyway, so it's quite interesting because I guess I sort of assumed, you know, yeah, like Antarctica's cold, right? Like it is cold. But I hadn't thought about the conditions that would lead to a place that is the coldest place. First of all, it has to be in the Antarctic winter. So that's when it's sort of um, 24 hours of midnight, essentially. The air has to be still. The sky needs to be clear. No clouds, not even a shimmer of dust. And that's because even ice will radiate a tiny amount of heat. And if there's water vapour in the atmosphere... It will get trapped and back down and sort of kept in the Earth's, near the Earth's surface. But if it's completely dry, there's no clouds, there's nothing, all that heat can go right out into space, giving these really, really, really cold conditions. So I think the coldest temperature was right down near the surface of the ice. At about human height, it would be a couple of degrees warmer at human head height and these temperatures have been measured by satellite measurements rather than actually being there which i also thought was quite interesting well yeah because you wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> no i would want to be there i mean like respect to people who go and work in antarctica i i would love to see it but i don't think i would really want to be there for much longer anyway so well, not to these places <laughs> yeah. cover your mouth somehow but uh, we're talking not just like the whole of Antarctica we're talking mm. the actual valleys and things yeah, like important deep. because that cold air sinks down to the bottom of these valleys mm. as well um, yeah so what was that 90 minus 97.8 or 144 in crazy measurements that yeah. Americans use minus one yeah that's yeah that's um, that's it's horribly colder than here yeah I think it we will. can all agree that's horrible <laughs> No, wouldn't wouldn't cope, and uh, even I'll with say, one breath. I think it's quite interesting. Is this is um, sort of as far as we know, the the place that's likely to be the coldest place. It's not like we're out measuring temperatures in Canada or Siberia and going, oh well, probably Antarctica was colder. This is probably the limits of how cold it can actually get on Earth in natural circumstances because I think the actual coldest places on earth are in labs aren't they where they're trying to simulate conditions close to Um, my impression was the coldest place on earth is uh, Peter Dutton's heart oh Uh, so (laughs) maybe there are places in labs as well perhaps I shouldn't laugh at that yeah no yeah (laughs) the satellites can't get there because it's all in secrets impenetrable (laughs) (laughs) Government uh, secrets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, interesting. But, and, and as you say, the use of satellite technology mm. is also impressive because obviously this is somewhere that we're studying a lot with satellites when you get the uh, ice shelf melting and uh, raising seawaters and that. So we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, Lucas, we've talked before about mind controlling parasites, like the fungus that can back infect. To, back Sorry? to Dutton. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give the example of the fungus that can infect ants and makes them climb trees and things like mm, that. And wave their bums in the air. Say, yeah. eat me, eat me. Yeah. <laughs> but most of the time we've believed a parasite has to actually infect an animal in order to control it. So is it possible for parasites to control the minds of animals without physically infecting them? Well, we're not sure. <laughs> but uh, okay. <laughs> putting that so, down as a maybe moving on <laughs> <laughs> um it, it does appear that that's the case there, there's a a group who were doing a study on this this tapeworm that that uh, is called i can't say these uh these latin um species names have you got Schistocephalus? it there in front of us yes thank Solitis you. or salidus I don't. I just. I'm in constant <laughs> awe. <laughs> say it again. Schist- say it again. Schistocephalus or schistocephalus solidus. Yeah. Yeah. I that's close to what I said. 
The description in the article, I think, describes it as tagliatelle pasta. So um, that's that's probably yeah. the... Which sounds <laughs> yummier than I think it really would be. Yeah, I think, I'm not um, eating this. <laughs> yeah, because it also, it also described it as a parasitic towel with a grappling hook for a head. Um, wow. So, yeah. So that's not a pasta Yum. that I want to feast on, but uh, but yeah. So this this thing basically lives inside the guts of water birds, uh, or re- rather, it reproduces inside the guts of the water birds. But it, and and then the water birds, when they do their poo, um, its eggs go out with the poo, and then after the those eggs hatch, the larvae basically infect crustaceans, um, and then those crustaceans are eaten by stickleback fish. Which are then eaten by water birds, so that's the life cycle for of this thing. I think I need it sounds that. like one of those Rubik Goldberg machines. <laughs> like, just there's so many things that need to occur in order for there's this a to candle that's going to burn a rope to release a weight at some right. point. <laughs> yeah. So apparently, it also when it's in the stickleback, it somehow manages to change the behaviour of the of the of these fish, so that it makes them swim toward warmer water because the warmer water is actually more uh, amenable to their growing to their their optimal size and then when they are at that size apparently they're they're they can make up up to half of the the weight of the of the fish so that's i mean that's that's a freeloader that you surely i you'd think you'd notice i'd be thinking you'd notice but apparently the fish doesn't notice it it just goes along with it and then even more it makes the fish basically just not care um, it's like it makes the fish just just be quite prepared to approach predators to have a chat or whatever. I don't think it's, oh, it's very friendly. Chat. It's friendly. It's friendly. It's more that it just doesn't care. So they they actually I loved this bit. They actually made these. They made pretend birds. They made artificial birds, which were a sort of a fake beak on a bench stick, and they could jab the water, jab jab these into the water with a handle. I'm kind of just, you know, remember those those um, those um drinking birds? You know, those things yep. that kind of yeah, blop, yeah, yeah. Blop, blop, yep. and then they go back. That's what I'm imagining. But get this, it was made of Lego. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? Everyone loves Lego, <laughs> but they basically were using these Lego pretend birds to, to scare the fish. And what happened was when they jabbed these these, these birds into the water and so I imagine they kind of you know splash it around a little bit or whatever um, most of the fish would would go and hide amongst the rocks and that sort of thing but the fish that were that were infected with this parasite just wouldn't bother they apparently just barely responded at all I guess they've in- inferred from that that they didn't care not that they just had some sensory problem maybe they couldn't detect it somehow maybe they lost their ability to detect Lego birds I'm not sure but um <laughs> Because you know the other fish still had the Lego bird detection thing happening. I'm not sure, but um, but that that was their uh, their inference that they um, that they weren't able to. They really just didn't care about it. And furthermore, because these fish they swim in in schools and they they you know they're school schooling fish. Schooling fish are very affected by the behaviour of their peers. So mm. when these fish that were infected didn't respond to the Lego bird, the other fish sort of went, huh maybe this Lego bird is actually not a threat to us. And they also apparently then were less bothered by the Lego bird. So that was interesting. Or maybe maybe they were smart enough to notice that the Lego bird wasn't actually taking any of their peers. It was just smacking its you know, orange Lego beak into the, to the water. I'm not, not really sure. But so um, in a way then, by infecting the one fish... It's also mind controlling the other fish because if they're not too bothered by uh, the bird, the other fish are not going to be too bothered either. So yeah, and again, that's that mind control is where they were going. Yeah, that's where they were going with that thing. Is like no, they are not directly mind controlling animals or hosts that they're not in, but they are impacting upon the the behaviour of the school because they're stupid. The school, they're just <laughs> just they just um, they like fish. They just like fish. They just <laughs> follow. So, um, so that, I just found it really interesting. And I think for me that the best part of this was the Lego bird. I just, I just thought it was great. I mean, you use, <laughs> you use what you've got, right? You don't. I, sure. Rachel Dunlop, doc, Dr. Rachel Dunlop, often tweets and and shares stuff about things that she because she she talks about when she's trying to buy equipment for the lab where she works mm. over in, the, in in the US, and yeah. she she often talks about well we could buy this for you know X thousand dollars or I could buy this thing that looks almost identical but it's for a completely different purpose from the local <laughs> hardware store so you know it's i guess it's a you, roll of you duct tape. what you can <laughs> right that's good yeah so yeah. 
but so, it's um, interesting picking it apart as well. So they're making a, a few options. So like it says that uh, if the tapeworm's infecting one of these stickleback fish, that at maximum size it can take up like half of the weight half its body of the stickleback. Weight. So like that's quite extreme. Um, and it says that it causes the, the sticklebacks to swim towards warmer water, which is sort of on the surface of the water. But I was sort of like thinking about it going, okay, well, is it that it's wanting to swim towards warmer water? Is it making the fish more dumb from, from having the parasite or having the tapeworm in it? Or is there something else going on? Is the tapeworm acting like, um, like eating hot? Like, yeah, like acting like polystyrene and making the, the <laughs> fish like more buoyant. So it goes closer to the, to the water. It's not that it's warmer. It's just that it's like feeling bloated and yeah. sort of like popping up towards the surface of the water. Maybe it can't actually duck down like all the other fish because it's full of, of worms and it can't actually get down into, into the, uh, the plants or the, the bottom of the stream. So there, there's a few other things that could change the behavior, not that it's sort of like sucking into its, its brain and, and mm. changing its behavior through that, that regard. Yeah, yeah. I, that's a good point because there was nothing that I did. Certainly in this story, this isn't uh, an Ed Young story. It's amazing how many Ed Young stories we do. Um, they're, they're, mainly because his writing is amusing. But um, uh, there was nothing in here that seemed to indicate there was there was evidence that that they were actually somehow controlling the host, other than you know the the observation of of, of the change in behaviour. So, but yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, I certainly I know when I'm fatter, I find it harder to, to dive. So. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. If you're full of tapeworms, it right. would do the same thing. Yeah. yeah, I imagine so. I imagine so. We've seen similar situations with toxoplasmosis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that were, you might have heard of that previously with toxoplasmosis infecting mice that then somehow makes them more bold. So then they're more likely to jump out in front of cats and not jump away. <laughs> and then the cats are more likely to eat toxoplasmosis <laughs> mice. And then uh, you do make it sound like they're trying to scare cats. the cats. It does. It sounds really... <laughs> I'm just imagining them going, ah, suck it, We're, big boy. <laughs> yeah, eat me. Eat me. And then the cats eat the toxoplasmosis, then uh, scratch pregnant women, right. and then the toxoplasmosis gets into the fetus and then causes blindness. So, um, so the, yeah, there's the cycle of You say of that with such that joy. <laughs> I don't know if it was joy or just uh, <laughs> nonchalance. <laughs> So, yeah, so it's that circle of life with uh, the toxic. Have you taken your bedtime the, matter just a little bit too far there? Well, the great well, news I, is, is this parasite <laughs> is really exciting. Bad news is you're going to be blind. Yeah. Well, well the, well, the, new, the news is your don't baby. have a kitten. If, right. So that's the, that's the, the main word of warning. <laughs> Yeah, but the toxoplasmosis goes through the cat's digestive system, out the back end, and then, uh, yeah, it keeps on going through that cycle. So you should never, you are always getting out of changing the kitty litter when you are pregnant. That is the, the lesson of the story. <laughs> cool. Very good. Uh, and it reminds me, I think we've mentioned it before, but uh, Ed Yong's TED, uh, TED Talk about parasites is really a must watch because it is very, it's gory, but funny, which I think is a good combination. You had mentioned that before, and just like that time, I thought to myself, I must make a note of that and watch it, <laughs> and hopefully this time I will. Well, we'll have a link to it in the show notes, of course. We'll infect you with a parasite to, uh, to encourage you to watch his video. Oh, thanks, Brad. Okay, sinister. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, let's move Look on. Look anything for science. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Let's move on. And Penny, how have the drawings in the margins of a 13th century manuscript got historians all a flutter? <laughs> I like that intro, Ed. Um, the drawings in the 30th, sorry, th not 30th. Um, wow, 13th. that's older than I thought. Yeah, so that's, that's why they're all a flutter. <laughs> um, no, the 13th century Finnish manuscript actually shows a cockatoo. Sulfur crested cockatoo. It might not be an Australian one, but one from Australia or the islands around. And that's pretty cool because, as far as we know, there wasn't a lot of contact between Australasia and sort of Northern Europe in the 13th century. The previous oldest depiction in Europe of a cockatoo was thought to be in a 15th century artwork. So this pushes that back by another 200 years or so. So the cockatoo is probably from the northern tip of Australia, New Guinea, or the islands around. 
And what it probably shows us is that there were trade routes, not direct trade routes as in people sailing, but, you know, at least some kind of link from that area all the way across Asia and I guess um, the Silk Road and up into Europe, which is actually pretty cool. I've seen the picture in the manuscript and to me it does look a lot like a cockatoo. I'm like, I'm, I'm sure that bird It does seem are, instantly recognisable, doesn't it? It really does. Like I'm sure, you know, there might be other birds that are similar that have been excluded, but to me I'm like, yep, that's a cockatoo. And it's not even in the 15th century artwork. It's quite a small one. You sort of have to really look at it and think, oh, is it? Could it be something else? But this one, I, like I don't know much about birds. What's pretty cool is it's probably just a picture of just one single bird that made it across. So cockies can live for, I think, up to about 60 years. So it really could have lasted quite a long journey across Asia. The other thing that I think is quite sweet is its crest is down, which apparently indicates that it was feeling quite relaxed and comfortable and safe and calm while it was being sketched. So... I think that's quite nice. The, the crest being up is something they do when they're sort of aggressive or surprised or if they're trying to court. But, um, yeah. Well, it could also have been um, relaxed because it was on holiday in Rome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, could have been that. Have you ever been to Rome? Skeptical. It's not that relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm very sceptical of this, really? I have to say. Like, yeah, because we've seen this before. Like there was some drawing, of, I think it was of a, of a kangaroo or something, and everyone was jumping uh, yeah. up and down saying, oh, wasn't this like I a... I see what you did there, Brad. Everyone was <laughs> jumping up and down like a kangaroo. Yeah. <laughs> jumping up and down about the kangaroo. And then it, you sort of look at it and you're like, well, it might be a kangaroo, but it could be a rat. Like it, it could be all sorts of different things. To me, it's just looks like a really sad albino parrot so like it, it, it could be <laughs> anything it doesn't have to be a cockatoo mm. if you were drawing a cockatoo like one of the distinctive features is that its crest does go up so it often goes up if it's inquisitive if it's being a bit cheeky so wouldn't you eating draw your, it? So your cedar banistrade it's uh picking yeah. all of the the rubber out of the the sides of your the car windows mm. uh, all of these sort of things. So wouldn't you have uh, have drawn it with the crest going up if that's one of the distinctive features? Plus, it's a, a sulphur-crested cockatoo, which I do love one of my friends who who thought it was a selfie-crested <laughs> cockatoo for many, many years until he actually saw it written down and went, oh, my God, it's not because it likes taking selfies. So... <laughs> I guess the, the other thing is that there is a sort of a, a reason, uh, like another reason to think it could be, is that Frederick II was known for having a large menagerie that was presented to him by the uh, Sultan of Egypt at the time. So if he was known as a collector of exotic sort of animals and birds, then it's this bird could have got all the way to Egypt and then up there. So it's, it's not, I guess, it's, it's not, it's it's not, not impossible. It's not outside the realms of possibility. Yeah, that if there was a cockatoo, it would probably, you know, floating around in Europe, it probably would have ended up in this guy's court. But, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting because I guess we know there was no boats going direct from Europe. Australia wasn't, quote, unquote, discovered until much later. But I think it's very easy to think it was very that region was really isolated from the rest of the world but the indications are maybe that it wasn't so i i, I guess i i can see why you're skeptical i mean to me the crest does look yellow and you can see there's a bit of shading under its wing as well the uh, authors also mentioned that um they believed it was a red sulfur crested cockatoo because it had uh, uh, sorry female, a, a female yeah. because yeah. it had red in its eyes and the male eyes are black so that was that was interesting but i mean yeah i mean the, a skeptical position is the correct position to take isn't it that's where we should start until we're we're presented with a, with sufficient evidence to uh, to accept it yeah it's one data point is all we've really got here and it could be a, an imagination, a, a fictitious drawing that someone's come up with. It could be, as Brad said, like an albino parrot or something, which would also be a rare and exotic bird kept in the menagerie, etc. It's interesting, though, I guess, that the default position to be sceptical is, well, of course, there was no contact. And maybe our default position should be, well, obviously, there was going to be some kind of trade contact. Yeah. We should be sceptical when someone says, no, there was nothing. You know what I mean? Like, I... I 
I'm, I'm not arguing either way, but it did make me question. No, like, no. Why do I assume that obviously there was no contact and it was completely isolated and, yeah. I agree. I, I, don't, I think if you were looking at this from the perspective of an Occam's razor approach, you would say, well, it looks like a self-aggressive cockatoo. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's very identifiably, you know what I mean? It's, it, it very much looks like a self Maybe the beak is a bit sort of more raised at the, at the top of the bridge, sort of like bridge of the nose, bridge of the beak sort of thing. But that, that crest is quite um, indicative of, of a cockatoo. So, but as you say, neither of us are bird experts. But uh, but no, I mean I think it more as a general statement. I think it's it's uh, it's a very healthy thing to to say. Okay, well, I won't just take this directly on face value until uh, you know until I can confirm it in other ways. It is an intriguing possibility. Another hobby of mine, and I don't have an actual link, is looking at art blogs which critique the artistic skills of monks who drew and illustrated medieval manuscripts. And there's a lot of things where they've been told clearly, you need to draw an elephant. Or you need to draw a whale, and they've just got no idea what an elephant what or a like. whale might look like, and they're just like, "Fine, I'm mm. just going to go for it." Whereas this seems to have been drawn quite carefully, and the one below it—I mean, I don't know what kind of bird that is—but it, it does look like there's a lot of some attention kind of to detail, bird. and yeah, some some mm. kind of water bird. Bird. <laughs> it looks a bit a like a roadrunner. The, it's the top of its head looks like the roadrunner to me. <laughs> it the does. bottom is clearly a word, uh, anyway. water bird. I think, well, the jury's out. I think it's an intriguing possibility. It might be a cockatoo. It might be some other exotic bird or a fictitious one. But it's still interesting and uh, we might see some follow-up studies or other examples in other artwork. We've got to wait for more manuscripts now. Yeah. We've got to wait for more. Uh, all right, Brad, you're a committee member for Australian Skeptics, Inc., a fine organisation that does a really great job, actually, of promoting critical thinking, uh, scientific literacy, and I guess campaigning to lessen the damage from some of the charlatans out there, the anti-vaccination lobby, unproven alternative medicines, that sort of thing. Do you want to tell us what you've got happening in October? Yeah, well, I, I sort of got into scepticism because of uh, seeing a lot of woo that was out there for, for my patients. Um, but yeah, coming up um, soon, we will have on the 13th and 14th of October, the Australian Skeptics Convention or Conference, so Skepticon. Um, I will be leading a panel um, which is aptly named Somebody's Wrong on the Internet. <laughs> so I'm very much looking forward to that. Right. We'll so that's why I can't come to bed. Someone's <laughs> wrong on the internet. Is, is the panel just all about Science on Top podcast and the things that we've gotten wrong over our seven years? <laughs> I don't think we're going to pick you out. Uh, Thank you. But uh, no, we'll, we definitely we'll be having a bit of a health theme. So we'll be able to see uh, see what's going on, uh, what uh, pseudoscientific rubbish is, is out there. And, um, and yeah, look at how the that is being perpetuated and what people can do to uh, to go against it and try to fight back against some of the misinformation that's around. So the 13th and 14th of October, it'll be in Sydney. So um, certainly go to the Australian Skeptics uh, webpage and you'll be able to see all of the details there. Yeah, and some fantastic uh, speakers in that as well. A uh, friend of the show, Dr. Karl Kruselnitsky will be there. Uh, psychologist. But he was he was chomping at the bit. He asked <laughs> if he could come along, and we <laughs> we reluctantly said yes. We're like, oh, you, you have to. Yeah, no, he's such a lovely guy. He's absolutely amazing. He is, and I think he loves skeptical events as well. I've seen him at QED in Manchester. Uh, numerous uh, skeptical conventions. Uh, around the world um, so I think he said put his name down for the next 10 years convention <laughs> so he's, he's going to be around go for it <laughs> also uh, Dr Alan Duffy another friend of the show a great astronomer and astrophysicist uh, he'll be there Excellent. Great accent. With great white coats as well. Look, yeah. yes. Pretty much, I think you've gone through all our top guests. You've got Dr. Lynn Kelly also talking about uh, memory uh, as well. She's our, our memory expert. And our very good friend, Dr. Pamela Gay, is coming all the way over from the States to talk uh, astronomy as well. And I'm also excited to announce, and I haven't announced it yet, so this is the big reveal. She will be doing a talk for Science on Top, and we'll be doing a live show as well with Dr. Pamela Gay on the panel on October the 10th. Uh, 
in Ligon, well, just off Ligon Street in Melbourne. So we'll have details of that on the website, scienceontop.com. It'll be affordable. It'll be fun. It'll be a small, intimate uh, thing with a question and answer opportunity. If you've got some space questions that you want answered, she is the go-to person for all things astronomy. Uh, so like I said, we'll have details of that on the website very soon. And one of the latest announcements is that the Cybabe will be coming along to the convention yeah, as well. Yeah. So, uh, And we've got to just say, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So many other cool uh, people from linguists to archaeologists, filmmakers, journalists, all sorts of people. So a fantastic event, two days in October. The previous Skeptics Conventions have all been terrific events. If you get a chance, if you can get a ticket, uh, definitely get in. And that's our show. And as always, the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 302. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Or an even cheaper way to help us out is to just spread the word. Tell your friends to listen to us, talk about us on social media, get the word out. Uh, Dr. Brad Mackay, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Where's the best place for people to find you on the internet? Well, certainly you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. You can easily find me at Dr. Brad Mackay. Um, doctor is just D-R and Mackay is M-C-K-A-Y. Um, Brad's in the middle there somewhere. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm often hanging around and answering people's questions online. So it'd be great to see everyone one there and uh, get everybody's comments. Um, I'll, as you're saying, I will be at Skepticon 2018. Um, somebody is wrong on the internet. So we need to uh, can, like make sure that we're doing all of those corrections on the day. Um, I'm also on the ABC. I'll be on Matter of Fact on ABC News. Um, I was talking with Stan Grant um, every couple of weeks I'm on at the moment. So um, tune in and we'll be talking about health. Very, very cool. You're a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get around. <laughs> and of course, thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Health Organization will recognize gaming addiction as a mental health disorder. What will <laughs> Doc Siegel have to say about that? Because he's with us now. By the way, there's a nine year old girl, British girl, I think. Uh, her parents sent her to therapy saying that she was addicted to playing Fortnite. I think you know something yeah. about that. Popular video game. Is there such a thing as addiction to play it? I think there is, and I think the World Health Organization calling this out will allow insurance to start to cover this. What? Therapy for this. What? Well, what? Well, but, well, Therapy wait. for gaming addiction? Because we got to pay for that now? Well, because it's another word for social isolation, Stuart. Now, Fortnite, I love Fortnite. Fortnite, it's a game, apocalyptic game, where you battle each other and one person survives. My 13-year-old, I asked him if he played it. He says, Dad, it's not what they're saying on TV. The truth is, people band together and they play it together and there's a social aspect. I said, what happened to you in that game? He says, I was annihilated. Well, I said, how did you feel? He says, didn't bother me. We started playing right again. But there's an, a violent aspect well, do you to think this. He's do you think he's addicted to playing that game? Yes, I you think do? he is, and I think others are, and I think his point is right, that you can be addicted well, wait, and still wait, have wait, all wait. life. Are you going to do an intervention? Are you going to say to your 13-year-old, no more Fortnite, intervening right here, you not, need therapy? Not my 13-year-old, but a 13-year-old who sits in a room and plays Fortnite all day long. They can be educational tools. They can be social interaction tools, the way my son says. But they can also be socially isolating, and I'm, I'm concerned about that.